Welcome to the best of the Geek Speak Show. Hey, what's going on, everybody? So, as we continue our month long break, we continue also with the Leviathan Chronicles Season 2, Episode Number 2. Thanks again to Christoph Lepudica for allowing us to play the two complete episodes, the first two episodes of Leviathan Chronicles Season Number 2. If you guys haven't heard Season 1, Go to LeviathanChronicles.com or go to our link section. It's on there for you. Catch up on that. Listen to the rest of Season 2. It's in progress as we speak. It's a science fiction audio drama featuring over 60 actors, professional sound effects, and an original music soundtrack. And it just sounds really cool. Really is why we're playing it. And it's up our right up our alley. It's uh, sci-fi. It's... Uh, a lot of action, a lot of uh, not a boring moment. I'll tell you that much. Those of you who have, who listened to last week's episode and emailed us saying we want more, we want more, you know that already. And here you are. Here is some more for all of you. Season two of the Leviathan Chronicles, episode number two by Christoph Lepatka. Here we go. The Leviathan Chronicles, season two, Chapter 27, Ascension of Necessity The sky above Leviathan City was filled with dark clouds and gloom, reflecting the anxious mood of the city as a whole. Bits of clear sky could be seen in the distance peeking out above the far-flung Genesis Zone, where a dedicated troop of mineralogists occupied themselves with the expansion of the Great Cavern. But overall, the long grey clouds infused a sense of melancholy to the normally inspirational sky above Leviathan. Now, twelve hours after the city had been placed on security status diamond, relegating all citizens to their homes or nearby collapse centers, a few bold souls ventured back upon the streets to assess the damage levied upon their beloved city. Work crews were still repairing the destruction on Tweedle Boulevard, and many of the large Zephyr-class vehicles in the West Hangar Bay had been damaged by Harlequin's dramatic escape, thus slowing the influx of fresh supplies from the surface as well as the undersea fishing trawlers that provided the fresh seafood that made up so much of the Leviathan diet. But worst of all, even from the distance, a large, gaping hole could be seen on the side of Leviathan Cathedral, surrounded by crumbling rock. Two of the large expanses of stunning stained glass that stood over 60 feet in height were blown out, with only tiny glistening shards remaining. But despite the turmoil and the moody sky lingering above, the deep purple grass of Leviathan's Abel Park swayed reassuringly beside the bright yellow marigolds that framed the cobblestone walkway through the park. A waterfall in the park's west end fell from more than a quarter of the way up the cavern wall to accumulate in a serene, reflecting pond, illuminated from below by gleaming emerald lumiflora. Near the center of the park, a cheerful statue of a young goddess playing with her beloved ferret usually brought a smile to Susan Nesterham's face, but today it did little to dissuade the anxiety in her conversation with her neighbor, Cynthia Court. I heard. She's unconscious. I heard she's passed, and they don't want to tell anyone yet. That can't be. We would have felt something, Cynthia. Maybe. Maybe not. What would you do? Do with what? What would you do if you're right? If Evangeline really is dead? You mean if I only had 20 or 30 years to live? I'm not sure. I haven't had to think about it for the last few centuries. I, I, I guess I would seek out my family in Gibraltar to see them before I died. Your family's been dead for 200 years. I meant I'd seek out the descendants. My sister's children, or I guess her children's children, or their children. Well, you know what I mean. They'd never believe you. They'd think you were just some mad person, probably have you arrested or something dreadful like that. You know, we don't belong up there anymore. Well, if you're so smart, what would you do? I'd try to find Senshin or those that left in the rebellion. They've gotten used to life up there by now. They could help us. That's madness. Evangeline said Senshin and his rebellion murder immortals when they find them on the surface. He'd murder you. Perhaps. But if you're right, Cynthia, I'm going to die anyway. The pair walked in silence for a few more minutes and eventually left the park. Did you feel that? I did. What was it? I don't know. You don't think that? There! 
The cavern wall of Leviathan City exploded 800 feet above Weller Street. A giant spray of rock and seawater showered down upon the street. Boulders the size of automobiles rained down on the citizens, obliterating the structures beneath. One mammoth chunk of the cavern wall plummeted down, demolishing a smooth white semi-oval building that served as Leviathan's modern art gallery. Huge pieces of the structure flew everywhere as Susan and Cynthia ran for their lives. The pair sprinted to the collapse shelter they knew was only a block away. Cynthia, come on! Run! We have to run! Cynthia! Susan frantically looked to her side and was astonished to not see her best friend running alongside her. A fine mist of deep seawater now cascaded through the southwest quarter of Leviathan City and stunned Susan's eyes as she desperately scanned the chaotic street for her friend. Cynthia! Cynthia! Susan raced back towards Weller Street, turning sharply around a five-story fortified teepee that served as the shamanistic research center for Leviathan. She stopped short in her tracks and saw her dear friend for over a century and a half lying face down on the street. A two-foot-wide titanium support beam from the collapsed art gallery was protruding through her friend's abdomen. Cynthia, my love, Cynthia. Susan Nesterhan didn't have the luxury of dwelling on the loss of a friendship she had warmly assumed would last another thousand years. High above her, just under a mile towards the city center, another explosion in the upper cavern wall tore through Leviathan. The boulder that fired out of the cave ceiling punched a hole in the carefully illustrated sky. Bits of Lumaflora fell downward, shattering the illusion of clouds floating thousands of feet above them. The boulder also smashed through one of the sky tubes running across the Leviathan City skyline. The push pod that was racing across had no time to slow its usual speed of over 70 miles per hour. With the sky tube cracked open and pointing downward, the push pod sailed outward unfettered into the city sky like a bullet shot out of a barrel. It plunged another thousand feet, landing two inches in front of Susan. And then proceeded to slide over her for the next 100 meters. Damn it, damn it, damn it. It's all down to rot so fast, so damn fast. Didn't even get a bloody warning signal. Into here. Mayor, it's Chief Engineer Denson. I just wanted to let you know that all group chiefs are now assembled along with their aides in the Undercity War Room. We're awaiting your arrival, sir. Understood. Thank you, Marcus. I'm on my way. Oh, and Marcus. Yes, sir. Is... is he there? If you're referring to the new military prime officer, Khan, yes, he's here. He looks like he could take on a bull shark and win. He brought his lieutenant, Keitha Watson, with him. She's quite nice on the eyes, but I don't mind telling you that she acts as ferocious as Khan. They were both sworn in a week ago after news of Gravelar's death. You can imagine their reaction towards the city's calamities. Oh, splendid. Who else is there? Well, uh, my underchief Astrid Ansler, of course. She's done a remarkable job handling the crisis and hasn't slept in 30 hours. She knows the Undercity grid chapter and verse. Uh, also, both representatives from Social, Chief... Juliet Brenton and Under Chief Pedro Santana just arrived. <laughs> that little Spanish bulldog looked fired up as usual. And Chief Juliet Benton? Serene and quiet as usual, frankly. I find it rather comforting to have a calming presence in the room. Where are you right now, sir? I just finished surveying the wreckage on Weller Street. Oh, absolutely horrifying. I'm entering a lift tube to the Undercity on Lafferty Avenue. No! I, I mean, no. Don't take the lift tube. Why on earth not? We're still getting operational errors throughout the city. You could get trapped, and it would take us hours to get you out manually. The city's a bit haywire right now, sir. I'll, uh, I'll give you a full briefing when you arrive. Uh, understood. I'll take the stairs past the Venotius Cafe on Richards. Uh, damn it. Leviathan City Mayor Zachariah Sinter hurried down the stone steps leading down to the first level of the Undercity. The steps were rarely used and some of the edges crumbled under his rapid footsteps. Mayor Sinter detested having to squeeze through the narrow access ways and tight corners that led to the Undercity War Room. Sadly, the current state of affairs within Leviathan left him little choice. Typically, the normal War Room Council Chamber of Leviathan extended out grandly above the city, integrated into the high cavern wall, but due to the imminent risk of structural structural instability. The emergency meeting was now being held in a modified blast bunker deep within the undercity of Leviathan. The room hadn't been used in decades. The mayor stormed into the chamber which was dominated by a long crystalline table that stretched far enough to seat 15 people or more. 
The room shimmered from the light of the 4x5 grid of 20 video monitors that displayed live feeds of the repair activity in Leviathan. Hover drones could be seen floating high above the city, applying layers of molten mag steel to repair the crumbling cavern ceiling. Along the sides of the table sat the group heads of each major division of Leviathan, military, social, engineering, as well as their immediate lieutenants. Between the recent collapse of the Great Cavern War and the civil system failures that plagued Leviathan's infrastructure due to the computer virus implanted by Banu, Mayor Sinter had his hands very full. All six people in the room stood as well. Would someone please tell me how the hell we could have a roof collapse? For more than a century, we've had a quadruple redundancy on both the Shield's power grid and all airlock portals. Correction, sir. We had quadruple redundancies. The Great Cavern is largely kept intact by the strength of the underlying rock that forms it. There are, however, several structural weak points within that geological matrix, specifically around the entry points, vehicle launch ports, and certain sections of the cavern ceiling. For years, we've reinforced those points with a quantum field generated by the super conduit grid beneath the city streets. Obviously, it takes a great deal of power to maintain the field integrity. In this case, the infecting virus induced a random power failure by causing phantom outages, thereby tricking the AI into rerouting its power away from the conduit grid. So what are the odds it happens again? Are we safe now, Marcus? Far from it. I've placed independent power generators at all critical points on the grid, but they won't last forever. Our power grid is growing less efficient by the hour and therefore consuming more and more power. The virus is essentially increasing the level of entropy within our civil management AI each minute. As the computer system accelerates into disorder, more structural failures will occur. Essentially, the virus is causing our city to careen into chaos and will soon destroy Leviathan. How long do we have? It's difficult to say, but I, I can't imagine that we have more than a week. Two at most. Ugh. The mayor sank back into his chair and stared at the council before him. Sinto was technically third in command within the administrative hierarchy of Leviathan City, behind Viceroy Banu and, of course, Lady Evangeline. However, his responsibility was technically limited to the domestic affairs of the city. The military branch of Leviathan enjoyed a direct reporting line to Evangeline, which, considering her current state of incapacitation, left them with unchecked power. Prime Military Officer Gamsuk Khan spoke first. This is madness, Sinto. We can't con continue another minute like this. We have a responsibility to the immortal population of Leviathan. If the virus can't be stopped, then I will assume military command of the city. You don't have the authority, Khan! Don't think for a second that because Evangeline is- I have the full authority to assume power if the city is in imminent danger of being destroyed. Pedro Santana, the short but fiery underchief of the Leviathan social group, stood up and lashed out at Khan. The city isn't under attack, and you are using our latest condition as an excuse to assert the power over this city. And you don't think for a second that you will get away with it. Prime Officer Khan glared back at Santana with a look that eagerly invited a physical response. Pedro had been a painter living outside Pamplona, Spain, and Khan had been a tribal warrior in Mongolia. Santana knew Khan viewed the artistic pursuits of the Leviathan citizenry as an indulgence granted by the romantic inclinations harbored by Evangeline. Khan's striking blonde lieutenant, Keitha Watson, spoke next. The Prime Officer and I believe that it's imperative that we initiate evacuation procedures at once. Evacuation? The serene social chief, Juliet Brenton, raised her slender hand up, bringing the room to silence. I strongly disagree, Lieutenant Watson. At a slender six feet tall, with gently curling chestnut hair to her mid-back, Juliet could easily attract attention, but instead deferred it to the citizens whom she supported. Evacuating the city is tantamount to abandoning it. By your suggestion, you are assuring the destruction of Leviathan and everything we have worked to create here. If Lady Evangeline were conscious, she would suggest utilizing the full resources of the city to solve the crisis. We are strongest as a community, together in our home, not scattered on the surface to be preyed upon by mortals. I agree. I agree fully. Whether you agree or not is irrelevant. I won't allow this city to disintegrate due to the inaction and fear from a small group of individuals that have become enamored of their own bureaucracy. Evangeline Liefrick was a courageous... What? The Under Chief of Engineering, Astrid Ansler, stood to shout at the Mongolian Prime Officer. May I remind you that her ladyship is still among the living. If Evangeline was conscious, there is no way she would authorize a mass exodus of the immortal Our population point that was precisely that she is not conscious. The citizenry deserves leadership and a clear resolution to this crisis that threatens our survival. Evacuation is the safest and most prudent course of action given your apparent inability to stem the destructive effects of this computer virus on our civil infrastructure. Now, this is the Prime Officer and I... Council! Khan, you do not have the authority to evacuate the city. Not without our support. 
You know that. Even if your mandate allows the military to assume temporary control of our administration in the event of a catastrophe, you'll still need our help to mobilize the citizenry. I think you overestimate your influence within the citizenry. And I think you underestimate the panic created by telling people to leave the homes they've had for centuries because our own Viceroy turned out to be a traitor. Benno was always sympathetic to the military branch of Leviathan. Don't think that connection will go unnoticed by our citizenry. No. There'll be no evacuation, at least not at this point. In fact, I'm going to recommend something even more to the contrary. A retrenchment. We need to utilize every resource, every immortal mind at our disposal to solve this crisis. I'm ordering a full recall of all Dark Water agents under cover on the surface, and all Leviathan citizens currently on surface leave. When everyone is back within Leviathan, we'll create a task force under my supervision like to- Like bloody hell! To deal with this crisis and dismantle or repair the AI system that now threatens us. I won't allow that. The Darkwater agents fall under my jurisdiction. It is our officers. You're wrong, Khan. The Darkwater team falls under the political division of Leviathan. Which is right now without a leader. I am the political division of Leviathan. As mayor of Leviathan, I have full authority to... This is a closed meeting. The guard should have stopped you before... Oh, I had a word with the guards. I told them there was some important news I had to deliver. And also that I might be bringing cupcakes. McAllen, Orsel, and Anton walked calmly into the war room, feeling the eyes of the entire council burning into them. Gentlemen, I believe most of you are familiar with Miss McAllen, Orsel. We are. Then I think you'll agree that she should have a place at this table. Over my... I don't... Let me make my position very clear. I know I'm not a part of this committee. And I know I have only recently come to Leviathan. But with every fiber of my being, I care about this city as if it were my own. My only wish is to preserve and to protect Leviathan and the Eden Initiative long enough for Evangeline to regain control and reassume power as the immortal leader of our people. Oh, I beg your pardon. Well and good, but that's However, like th in the unlikely event that Lady Evangeline does not recover from her injuries, I will be taking her place as leader of Leviathan. At least until the situation is <laughs> What this bitch thinks she is? I think that I may be the only person on the planet that has the power to save the lives of every single immortal in Leviathan City. Have you asked yourselves how Leviathan will continue when the citizens begin to die? When the friendships and relationships that have existed for centuries disintegrate to the death toll that your council refuses to stem? They'll ask why you didn't put into effect a succession plan that Evangeline herself wanted enacted and let me facilitate communication with the life-giving starstones that we have depended on for a thousand years. The citizens that you claim to represent will want to know why. And I promise you that sooner rather than later, those same citizens will eventually grant me the power that you are seeking to deny me now. And when I do get it, it's not going to be pretty for the people in this room. She's trying to blackmail us. The citizenry of Leviathan will never stand for such an illegitimate and brazen attempt to use her power. You'll never get away with this. For once, we agree. Uh, if I may... Anton stepped forward and pointed to the large amethyst ring he was wearing. That's where you are precisely wrong. This entire conversation is being video recorded and is currently being viewed by Maestro Viberucci and Lorelei in their studio as we speak. If McAllen is not granted control, this video of you specifically denying her power will be broadcast across the cavern sky, and it will be you that is blamed for the loss of our immortality, and you that will be vilified. For now, all she wants is to have her ideas heard. Now, may I suggest that Miss Orsall be granted a seat at this council's table? You're completely out of line, Anton. You continue to be as treasonous as ever. You and your rebellion vermin can- She may sit near me. Or by me. Both Chief Juliet Brenton and Pedro Santana stood up. Or me! Chief Engineer Denson was surprised to see this sudden rebellious streak from his second-in-command, who was normally quite quiet. Under Chief Ansler was a bit of a bookworm that excelled at the analytical portion of engineering. <sighs> he sighed and stood as well. I, I think given McAllen's unique status within Leviathan, we can at least listen to what she has to say. What say you, Mayor? Oh, for fuck's sake, Marcus. Proceed. The council fell silent, and McAllen slowly walked to the head of the table. The military group of Lieutenant Watson and Prime Officer Khan said nothing, but stared intensely at her. Members of the council, the immortal world is in crisis. We know now that our society has been infected from within. Viceroy Bennu was corrupted by the Seraxian aliens that Evangeline had been hiding deep within Leviathan Cathedral. Although she currently cannot speak, 
I believe Evangeline had very good reasons for detaining the aliens within Leviathan. And what do you suspect those were? We can't be sure. But my suspicion is that she thought they represented some sort of threat. If they were in league with Bennu, then they must have something to do with the virus that's infecting our city's AI. What is it you propose, McAllen? We need to find the aliens. Find out where they are right now. They were able to escape through a keyhole, but we don't know where it led. They represent the best chance we have of saving Leviathan as well as Evangeline. What do you mean? This is the latest report from the Med Tower. Anton touched the data pad he was holding, and three of the screens on the far wall filled with medical charts regarding Evangeline. Her brain activity has been declining for the last 12 hours. Look at her heartbeat. It's so erratic. And what does this have to do with the aliens, McAllen? It's simple. We find the aliens, we'll find a star stone. Right now, the city doesn't have one. The only way to heal Evangeline will be with a star stone. The only way to assure that our population can maintain its immortality is by finding a star stone. And for that, we need the aliens. Where exactly on Earth do you expect to find these aliens, McCann? Right now, I, I'm not exactly sure. But it is my hope that we'll be able to discern some clues from the chamber where Evangeline kept the aliens prisoner. I've already had my engineering team go over that area of the cathedral. From what we can tell, the Soraxian aliens jumped through a keyhole that was powered outside of Leviathan. It would appear that the corresponding keyhole was somehow destroyed on the other end. Without it, we have no way of knowing where the aliens could have transported. We need to find them in order to save Leviathan. Let's say you're right, McKellen. Let's say you can find the aliens. What in the goddess's name makes you think they'll help us? We kept them prisoner here for a thousand years. Why would they possibly cooperate with Lieutenant us? Lieutenant Watson surprisingly makes a good point. The lieutenant stared daggers at the mayor. They might not cooperate with me, but they might listen to a small strike force led by Anton and myself. Prime Officer Khan, I'll need four of your best soldiers ready to deploy in 12 hours. All eyes in the room widened when they heard McAllen directly requisition the Prime Officer. Social Group Chief Juliet Brenton permitted a wide smile to creep across her lips, while Engineering Underchief Ansler's mouth dropped as she fixed her glasses again and stared at her knees. Military Underchief Watson bolted out of her chair. How dare you give orders to the Prime Op- This time it was Prime Officer Khan who raised his hand up, calling for silence. You're a pushy bitch. Watch your fucking mouth, Khan. If it's okay, Anton. Yes, Prime Officer, I might be a pushy bitch, but I don't want your job, and I don't want to control this city, and I don't want to be the leader of Leviathan. You're not. But Evangeline asked me to take command if something should happen to her. She sensed a storm was coming to Leviathan. For that reason, she named me her successor. This council was not made aware of these succession plans. We can't name you as leader. I am the leader of Leviathan. Or at least I will be at the end of the day when we hold a citywide meeting where you support me as special council chair of Leviathan. As I said, I don't want to run this city. I just want the immortal race to survive. That won't happen without me or Evangeline. Therefore, you can think of us as one of the same. So for the time being, I am the leader of Leviathan, and I say we need to find the aliens to obtain a star stone. The war room fell silent, and Khan stared at McAllen, measuring her carefully. Let's just say for a moment that I give you what you want. Where exactly do you intend on taking four of my best soldiers? I don't know that yet. I need a little bit more time. Time is exactly what this city no longer has. Forgive me if I find your plan less than promising, McAllen. You forget, Mayor Center. We have one person who knows exactly where the other side of the keyhole led and where the aliens might be. We need to speak with Mai Lee. New York City. Damn it. Rebecca Kinderman was late. Her job at the New York Public Library had kept her 20 minutes past her intended departure. She worked in the rare books department and had been waiting to sign for a package from Sotheby's containing a first edition copy of Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. She sprinted out of her office onto Fifth Avenue, pausing only to give a playful wave to patience and fortitude, the two stone lions that stood sentry outside the library. Knowing she was late, Rebecca held the smallest modicum of hope that she might catch a cab going east on 42nd Street. But as she suspected, the slightest drop of rain caused every cab in New York to go off duty or be already occupied. And of course you don't have an umbrella. You never have an umbrella. <laughs> Growing increasingly wet, she made her way to Grand Central Station to catch the 6 train uptown, which was invariably delayed due to flooding on the tracks. 
The city that never sleeps reached untold levels of congestion whenever heavy rain struck Manhattan. Excuse me. <laughs> hey, watch your hand. Sorry. This, excuse me, this is my stop. Can you just, just move a bit? I gotta get out. As Rebecca exited on 86th Street in Lexington Avenue, the M86 bus lumbered past her, launching a filthy puddle of brown rainwater onto the sidewalk. Shit! Missing her legs, but soaking the gym bag she was carrying. I didn't really want to go to the gym tonight anyway. She turned right on Madison Avenue and walked another two blocks before entering a doctor's office on the ground floor of a pre-war apartment building. He's waiting for you in his office, dear. Hi, Dr. Pisker. Hello, Rebecca. I'm so sorry I'm late, Doctor. The traffic will... I mean, the rain is It's what... okay, Rebecca. You're my last patient today, and I could stay a little late. Why don't you sit down? Oh, thank you. So, how are you feeling this week, Rebecca? I'm feeling... good. Better, I guess. I'm glad to hear that. Now tell me how you're really feeling. But I just told you Rebecca, that... Rebecca... Please. Rebecca stared at her psychiatrist that she'd been seeing for almost a decade. I've been feeling very settled during the day. My job at the library has been fine. Well, not fine, but fine. I uh, applied for that promotion, like you said. I sense a but. But the nightmares haven't stopped. Is the medication? The medication is getting me asleep and keeping me there. But I can't escape them. Escape? What? My dreams, Doctor. Oh, has there been any variation? No. No substantive variation. It's just I'm seeing more of it. Some parts are getting clearer. The fog? Still there. But there's less of it somehow. Explain to me what you're able to see now. The dream still starts off the same way. I'm walking home from school. I can't tell if it's middle school or high school, but it's... Time for me to go home. I know my parents are expecting me, but I can't find the way. I'm getting lost somewhere in this old village. I'm, I'm walking through the streets and, and I see my friend Cornelia Becker's house in the distance. She's on the porch wearing a dress, an old dress. She's such a pretty girl with beautiful red hair, but she looks scared. Someone is watching us. She looks at me and then runs back into her house. I run forward to follow her inside, but the more I run, the further away her house gets. Then the fog starts to roll in and I can hear voices. So many voices, whispers. And I'm getting a bit lost and confused. And I can feel a presence nearby. Are you still in the village, Rebecca? No. I mean, it's hard to tell. The fog makes it hard for me to see anything in the dream. Sometimes I feel like the thing watching me is chasing me from behind. Other times, I feel like I'm walking right towards it. It knows everything about me. Does this... this thing watching you try to hurt you? No, no. It knows it could, but right now, it just wants to watch me and stalk me. Soon I, I realize I'm walking down an alleyway. There's water dripping down the sides and deep puddles in the street. I just keep walking down the alley, knowing that the end is coming soon, but I... Tell me, Rebecca, what do you think is at the end of the alleyway? I don't know, but I don't want to reach it. Why not? Because I'll be trapped, have nowhere to run. I'll be right where it wants me. The fog is lighter towards the end of the alley, and now I can see little bits of it. The thing, darting through the shadows of the fog. In the new dream, I can catch little glimpses of it. And what is it that comes out of the fog, Rebecca? What is it that's watching you? A demon. Back in the Himalayan mountains of Tibet, 
No, no, Door Chief. No casualties, but we lost the targets. Whit Roberts deployed a paraglider off the cave ledge and was able to drift behind the mountain, blocking our line of fire. We think one of the immortals aided him in his escape. Under current wind conditions, they could be 40 to 60 miles to the southeast. I'll get the SAT team to run recon on that region and try to pick up something on our birds over Tibet. In the meantime, I want a detailed sweep of the monk's cave you're in. The Chinese government sent a special ops team there several years ago. We need ago a fucking extraction quickly. We don't have time to... Hardwick, Whit Roberts is getting away. If he has one of the immortals helping him, then doorlock procedure may not affect them. If we lose them now, we may never get them back. I need an extraction, Hardwick. Black Door agent Celeste yes, Harris Hardwick. was livid that her operation had been a failure, but she wasn't about to give up yeah, easily. I know it doesn't make Whit sense. Roberts and Sension were still in hunting distance, and Celeste out. wasn't going to give up now. Fine, we'll talk in an hour. Harris out. Who is that? The boss. And what did the boss say? He wants us to finish looking around. What is it you're looking for? Celeste stopped in front of Oberlin. I lost an earring. Corporal, watch these two. If they move, shoot them. Celeste Harris joined the other three black door operatives deeper inside the cave as they searched for clues as to what door number 12 was doing in Tibet, and more importantly, where Whit Roberts might be heading. 30 minutes later, she and her team returned to the front cave antechamber. Oberlin and Tully stood shivering and still under guard. Did you... Find your earring. Celeste walked closer to stand in front of Oberlin and Tully, while staring at a small laptop computer that was held by one of the other Black Door operatives. In the fading alpine light emanating from the cave entrance, Oberlin noticed the long, faded red streaks that ran down Celeste's face. Who are you? My, my name is Jeffrey Tully, and this is Oberlin St. Clair. Hello. Why did Black Door hire you? Hire us? No, there must be some mistake. Nobody hired us, lady. We were kidnapped. Kidnapped? Wait, Roberts kidnapped you to Tibet, so he could just leave you here in an empty cave in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Well, not me, actually. He kidnapped Oberlin, but I... Oh, so how did you get here? I, um... I jumped through this portal thing called a keyhole to get here, but... See, I was in the Marianas Trench a few hours ago. Look, I know this all sounds crazy. No, no, keep going. This doesn't sound crazy at all. You certainly can't have anything to do with a global plot that threatens the human species. I'm, I'm sure you guys were just a bunch of innocent bystanders, aren't you? Corporal, what do we have? We ran biometrics on face and prints. Their cover checks out. See? He said your cover checks out. That has nothing to do with who you actually are. Look, I told you. I'm, I'm just... I'm just a washed up boat captain. Oberlin's my first mate. I do charter runs out of Homer, Alaska. I, I, I got nothing to do with what's going on. Commander, I found this on him. The soldier handed Celeste a small black brick-like device that he had fished out of Tully's pocket. Her eyes tightened for a moment in scrutiny of this strange object that seemed much lighter than it appeared. For a split second, Tully thought he saw her eyes grow wider in amazement as she examined the object from all angles. Finally, she turned to the operative. Hold them here and uh, don't let them take anything else out of their pockets. Celeste Harris left the antechamber of the cave entrance to walk back deeper inside the cave to confer with one of the other D-20 operatives. After ten minutes, she returned and stood in front of Oberlin and Tully, holding the device in her hand. What is this? Um... It's the new iPhone. I found it at this bar. This is a superconducting railgun using a liquid oxygen cooling system able to launch a frictionless projectile at 10 times the speed of the highest power sniper rifle known to man. It'll also tell me where my friends are, what the weather is in Bangkok, and the closest bar serving happy hour. What's the big deal? The big deal is that any government in the free world hasn't invented it yet. Even the casing is constructed out of a carbon ceramic polymer that's only been theorized. I'm not sure I get the point. The point is that I don't think you're some washed up boat captain from Alaska. This alcoholic loser act isn't fooling anyone. I think both of you work for Whit Roberts, and I think you don't give a fuck. No, no, not at all. You've got it all wrong, Miss Harris. Well, the alcoholic part's true. Whit Roberts works for Black Door, not us. We wouldn't do anything like what you just said. We just, we just want to go home. Agent Harris put her Sig Sawyer P226 pistol back in its holster. Then why don't you start by telling me what the two of you were doing here? Look, I got kidnapped by Whit Roberts. What Tully told you was true. I don't really understand what he was doing here, but he said it was a rescue mission. That's all we know. We swear it's all we know. Well, I guess that's your final answer. Thanks for playing, Tully. You too, Oberlin. Celeste turned and began to walk away. So, what happens now? What do you mean? We're packing up, leaving, absconding to the next undisclosed location. No, no, I mean, what are you going to do with us? Nothing. Leave you here. Can't kill you. You haven't done anything wrong. 
right. Agent Harris picked up her rucksack and started to walk towards the cave entrance as the other operatives collected their equipment and quickly followed behind her. Whoa, whoa, lady. Tully ran forward and roughly grabbed Celeste's arm. Hey! Tully! Uh, hey! Uh, let him go! Uh, <coughs> that's Agent Harris. Look, I'm, I'm sorry. Agent Harris, you, you, you can't just leave us. Watch me. Please, if... If you and your team just leave, we've got no way to get out of here. I mean, we'll freeze to death within hours. We'll die before we even reach the path to Tingri. That's pretty much the plan. Or you could tell us what the hell you were doing with Whit Roberts. Agent Harris, if you don't- Look, I don't know who the hell you are. Even knowing about Black Door's existence makes you an incredible liability. The two of you just disappearing on a remote mountaintop and freezing to death is, quite frankly, the best thing that's happened to this operation all day. Look, I- I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just a boat captain, seriously. It's a really long story, but I swear it's true. We got nothing to do with this thing that's going on. Have fun cuddling to stay warm. Celeste zipped up her goose down parka and walked out of the cave into the Himalayan mountains. Look, please don't leave us here. We've been through enough. Agent Harris, Agent Harris, at least give us a jacket, please. Agent Harris, I know about the aliens, the Seraxians. The Black Door assault team reappeared at the cave entrance. Celeste Harris took a few slow steps forward, considering Tully and Oberlin. What did you say? The aliens. They're the cause of all this, aren't they? The extraterrestrials? Celeste stared at this odd man, dressed in jeans and a t-shirt in the middle of a hidden Tibetan monk's cave in the Himalayas. He wasn't supposed to be here. Neither was his friend. Something from her training made her believe him. Look, I swear, I'm not part of Black Door, or Whit Roberts, or anything. Oberlin and I are just mixed up in something we don't understand, and we just want to go home. I'll tell you whatever you want. Talk. You're looking for Whit Roberts, right? I'd love nothing more than to see that son of a bitch dead. Me too. I can help you. I think I know where he's heading right now. I can also tell you what he's trying to do. Tell me. No, I need a plane ride. You gotta get me and my friend out of here. Get us out of Tibet, and I'll tell you what you want to know. How do I know you're not bluffing? Because you're holding a ceramic polymer railgun in your hand that you know shouldn't exist. That's because the technology that built it came from someplace other than Earth. And you found that device in my pocket. You know the aliens are real. And you know I've seen them. And I know where Whit Roberts and Sension are going. You're holding the proof in your hand. Now do we have a deal, Agent Harris? Will you get us out of here? Okay, Captain Tully. You've got yourself a deal. to the southeast of Mount Shenlong. Oh. You, you inside. I, oh. Yeah, yeah, take a leg. I mean, sit. Senshin and Whit Roberts entered a small clay brick building adjacent to a remote Buddhist monastery built along the Kula Gangri mountain ridge. Prayer flags snapped violently outside as the frigid Himalayan winds picked up again. The two men limped inside and each collapsed exhaustedly on a small pile of colorfully woven flax and mats. Senshin's shoulder ached and each breath pained Whit Roberts as his expanding chest aggravated his broken rib. A young boy wearing the orange robes of a monk entered the room and brought each man yak butter tea in a small steaming mug. Gotcha. Gotcha. The young monk nodded without making eye contact with the two western strangers and quickly left the room. This Tibetan tea tastes horrible. I told you, we're not in Tibet, we're in Bhutan. We flew 10 miles over the border. Well then, I don't know much about Bhutan, but I can safely say that their tea stinks. You know, you really astonish me. How about a little gratitude, Wit? That herdsman found us limping along the high ridge trail, carried you on his yak, invited us to his home, giving us shelter, which by the way is hiding us from satellite recon. You could be a little more forgiving. If I recall, you gave him a $75,000 Patek Philip automatic chronograph watch. I think that entitles us to a little more than a cup of tea. He didn't know what kind of watch it was. You probably thought it was a Timex. This is exactly what I mean. You totally missed the point, don't you? That farmer helped us because we needed help. When you give assistance, you make yourself richer. Even the poorest people know that wit. It's what humanity is based on. Or are you that far removed from it? <laughs> Save it for a fortune cookie, Senshin. Ah, shit. Senshin watched Wit bring his hand up sharply to the side of his ear and then draw it away. He stared at the small drops of blood that had accumulated on his hand. What happened to your ear? Occupational hazard. Wit, look around. You're not in Langley, you're not in that air fortress I've heard rumors about. We're in a small tea house in Bhutan, about a day's walk to the nearest road. You're badly injured and we're both trying to get warm, so do us both a favor and drop the asshole routine. I saved your life, you owe me that much. 
Remember that Irish guy down in the cave? Of course. Oberlin St. Clair. He works with Captain Jeffrey Tully. He ripped my ear off. Why did he rip your ear? Because we got into a fight. A very, very big fight. I can see that. It's not really about the ear. I don't care about that. Or my ribs, or my head, or any other wound in the line of duty. What got me was the loss of anonymity. I, I have to wear a prosthetic ear now, just to go unnoticed. That hurts more than any injury or gunshot. Hiding came so easy to me. Now it's harder. And when it gets cold and stings, it makes me miss the shadows, where I was safe, where I was effective. Don't you ever get tired of it? Of what? The hiding, the running, the hunting, the constant concern of looking over your shoulder, always trying to figure out the next move. Doesn't it exhaust you? Uh, no. M maybe sometimes. But then I remember the reward of knowing that I have the privilege of making a difference in what I do. Black Door has that effect. You know, I used to have a job where nothing mattered. I got in my car and I went to work every day and nothing I did ever made a difference in the direction of the world. Do you know what that feels like, Senshin? To think that you'll never be special? To wonder if your existence even matters? But now, things are different. And the work I do for Black Door can change the course of history. So, no, I don't get tired of spycraft. But then again, I haven't been doing it as long as you have, Senshin. No, no you haven't. Trust me when I tell you that the glamour loses its luster when you start watching people you care for die in the process. You killed a lot of my people, with. It was my job to defend the people and the things that I cared about, Senshin. Like America, other Black Door agents, other species of sentience that landed on this planet in peace. Immortality doesn't absolve you of sin, Senshin. You've got your own share of blood on your hands. The two men stared at the fire in silence and slowly sipped their tea. How long till your team can extract us? <sighs> Anjali says there's a landing field to the south that could handle the Leviathan jet, but it might be a few days' walk given the terrain. There's not any proper roads in the section of Bhutan, and helicopter transport will draw too much attention. I'm sure whoever is after you, Wit, has a lot of resources and is combing through satellite intel trying to find us. The farmer said that he and his sons are traveling to Ladang the day after tomorrow. Our plan is to go with them and blend into a larger group. We need to move sooner. We need to rest, Wit. You just had a concussion and your ribs are pretty sore. Just walking won't be easy. Ascension? We don't have that much time. We can't just lose a day, no. Well, right now, I don't see that we have much choice. Who attacked us on the mountain, Wit? Back on Mount Shungla. Forgive me, but we didn't have a chance to exchange business cards, okay? Cut the crap, Wit. If you want me to help you, I need to know what we're up against and if they're going to keep coming after us. I, I assume it's door number 20. The Enforcement Door. They function as a type of internal affairs unit for the Black Door Group. They are the only ones in the world that know what goes on behind each of the other 19 doors. You mean you don't know? Each Black Door operates completely independently from the other doors. None of us even know the purposes or jurisdictions of the doors located right next to us. I know door number 13 is Sino-American Affairs and is headed up by Mai Li. I know door number 16 concentrates on macro-military threats to the U.S. and the Western and Middle East theater. And I don't know what the hell goes on in doors 5 and 7, but <laughs> there's always a really weird smell coming out of their doors. And you know door number 20 is enforcement. Right. Enforcement. You see, Black Door operates beyond the purvey of congressional oversight. We have access to a largest of funds that has been growing since our formation after World War II. We don't need to ask for permission for spending or doing what we need to do to protect America. Each door has an ongoing directive that can only be countermanded by the president or the CIA director. <laughs> the catch is neither knows or acknowledges to know about our existence. How can the CIA not know you exist? You're technically part of them. During the formation of the CIA in 1947, a security protocol was put in place to ensure the protection of an elite intelligence force tasked with protecting American interests when conventional channels and laws proved insufficient. The primary goal was to research, develop, and protect the country at all costs against any perceived threat, using any means necessary and given all the resources possible. We fund ourselves through some legitimate businesses using shell corporations and, and some illegitimate ones. Perhaps. But since Black Door represents the root level of electronic security within the CIA, we have access to their entire database, as well as that of national and regional law enforcement, so we know how to not get caught. But that's what I don't understand. How can the CIA not know of your existence? Because they don't know where to look. In an organization where everyone keeps secrets, the Emperor can have no clothes. We were there at the start, you understand. So everything that American intelligence has become has been built around us. It's like a house with thousands of additions. But we have always had a key to the back door. New tenants don't get to question the older residents who have already been there for decades, get it? Amazing what you've been able to pull off with. But each different door must carry a different level of exposure. Surely you must share information on an interdepartmental basis. All black door groups share two things, and two things only. The first is a single hallway in the basement of Langley. Hardly anyone ever goes there anymore. Awkward elevator rides. 
And second, we share access to a single mainframe located in an abandoned oil rig in the North Pacific. That mainframe produces a 3D dimensional map that can graphically illustrate where black door activity is taking place on the globe. It doesn't say who or which door or what the nature of the activity is, but we have a very detailed sense of exactly where other black door agents are operating. As such, we do our best to avoid one another. Why? Because of door number 20 the enforcement door. There aren't many rules within Black Door, but one of them is that we don't have the authority to kill or endanger other Black Door agents. If D20 can find two concrete examples, they alone have the power to initiate a door lock on the offending door. I've heard that word before. What exactly does door lock mean? It means the end of your door. Shut down. As I said, door 20 is like internal affairs within Black Door. It was designed to have all the information about all the activities each door pursues. I don't know how they do it. I've always wondered, but they they know every account we use, every alias, every operation of each of the other 19 remaining doors. When door lock gets initiated, it means all our accounts are frozen. No money. No ability to operate. Mortals. Always worrying about money. It also means an execution order. Every member of your door is given a burn notice along with a cleaning team that's sent to neutralize each member, no matter where on earth you are. Door 20 won't stop until everyone in your door is completely clean. So now you're a hunted man. Not for long. What do you mean? The young Bhutanese boy re-entered the room holding a cast iron tea kettle and gingerly poured Senshin more tea. Whit Roberts shook his head and declined. Are you sure you can find the aliens, Senshin? I mean, really find them? If they're still alive, I know how to find them. The tracking device send is in New York. We need to get there as soon as possible. Why? Because Evangeline will be trying to find the aliens as well. She was obviously keeping the aliens prisoner to maintain the flow of star stones to Leviathan. If she can't get the aliens back, she won't be able to perpetuate the immortality of her citizens. She'll lose all of her power. She needs to get the aliens back. If Evangeline gets to the aliens first, it could mean the end of the world, Senshin. I already told you that I have a jet landing a few days' walk from here. You can't move any faster in your condition. Forget so I... me. Those keyholes that you immortals have, is there any limit to their operating distance? No. No, we've had matching keyholes scattered in all corners of the globe. So, Evangeline or others from Leviathan could already be in New York? Well, theoretically, but... No. No, that can't be. Evangeline had the keyhole network shut down after the rebellion. That's what you think. Benu had several keyholes reopened as he secretly partnered with Black Door to release the aliens. Jeffrey Tolley just leapt through one to get to Tibet. I can tell you for a fact that several keyholes are operational as we speak. Well, unless you know of one in Bhutan, we can't get to New York any faster. Maybe we can't, but I know someone else that can. You have been listening to Season 2 of The Leviathan Chronicles by Christoph Leputka. To listen to the entire first half of Season 2 right now and get exclusive storyline, purchase the director's cut of Season 2 at leviathanchronicles.com. For more updates and news, find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for supporting us. And thank you for listening. So that's episode two of the Leviathan Chronicles, season number two by Christoph Lepudka. Thanks a lot again, Christoph, for allowing us to play the first two episodes of season two. Those of you that are hooked, and I know it's a lot of you because you've sent an email to wait what at thegeekspeakshow.com saying, we love it. Give us some more. Here's a little tease what's coming up on season two. And I'll be right back to talk to you a little bit more about Leviathan Chronicles and what's coming up on the Geek Speak Show. Leviathan. A city of immortals now hangs in the precipice of ruin. Someone tell me how the hell we could have a roof collapse. It's imperative that we initiate evacuation procedures at once. And Macau and Orsall must wrestle with the mantle of leadership. You're the only one, Macau. This isn't my world! Or face the destruction of Leviathan. The Queen is down! Repeat! The Queen is down! The stakes have never been higher. Do you ever wonder why everyone seems to die around you? Nothing will happen to you if you help me. The dangers have never been greater. Fire! Don't quit! Jump! And those closest to her may not survive. We've been kidnapped by a monster. Oh, we're killing him! We're going to go about the making you a smaller man. Will McCallan save the immortal race? Give me my damn strike force! I will do what Leviathan is. Or will the Black Door group change the course of human history? The world will be a better place with your kind exterminated! We surrender. Hell we do. Get the hell back! The Leviathan saga continues. You wanted the mantle of responsibility. Now go earn it. Season 2 of the Leviathan Chronicles is now available on iTunes or at leviathanchronicles.com. Get it now and listen to the next dimension in podcasting. We will save Leviathan. Let's make sure Black Door will never know what hit them. 
So that's what's coming up on season number two of the Leviathan Chronicles. Again, you guys can go to leviathanchronicles.com, follow them there. Season one is also there in case you haven't listened to all of that. I'd say catch up and then jump on board to season two. Season two also, the director's cut is available to buy on the website on leviathanchronicles.com. It includes a special hour of uh, extra extra story that won't appear on the regular podcast. The podcasts are free, but the special hour will not appear on those podcasts. You can only get it if you purchase the director's cut of season two. Again, available on the website, leviathanchronicles.com. I would suggest you do go and get it because if you thought the last two episodes that you heard were pretty cool, wait till you hear the rest of it. I've been following for a while. Christoph and company do a pretty great job. So again, Christoph Lepudka, thanks a lot for letting us play episodes one and two of season two of the Leviathan Chronicles. Wish you guys nothing but the best. Now, for us, next week and into the next month, the rest of the month, we're going to continue our month-long break. But next week, we're not going to play Leviathan Chronicles for you. Matter of fact, we're going to get in our DeLorean and go way back to radio's golden age to a time when everybody sounded like this we're gonna go back to the golden age of radio specifically to 1955 to the nbc radio network when x X minus one one was on the air it was a very really cool really cool sci-fi weekly serial and i'm going to play something by the late ray bradbury it's called mars is heaven I was gonna say I was gonna tell you what it's all about, but it's on our webpage. And also, I'll just say this: if you've ever wondered what's waiting for us in the afterlife, if there even is an afterlife, we all think you know heaven, hell, if we haven't behaved here, or whatever it is, you know, religious or not, whatever it is, whatever you believe spiritually, whatever that is, you think is waiting for you in the afterlife. That's what we believe. What if we've been wrong about all that, and heaven is actually? Mars, the planet Mars. Hmm? Well, that's what next week's story is all about. Again, X minus one. Be back next week and we'll take you back to X minus one right here on the Geek Speak Show.